Welcome to the Wednesday Honors Luncheon Series. Um, in uh, Oak, the, uh, a new a new uh, report, a new sort of law passed in Oklahoma, uh, basically moved most of the funding. Funding had to basically show that it was for national security or economic interests of the United States. Basically, kind of constricting things that could that could be in in uh, in the humanities. Governor Rick Scott of Florida said anything that's non any non strategic discipline need to be really reprioritized. So you could definitely see in the United States that it's that it's really looking looking bad for the humanities. So I want to look uh, upstream and downstream of why this why this problem occurs, right? So downstream, right? At the end, after after college, we see students are not right are not going into humanities because they want to go into more lucrative fields, right? And upstream, and, and right, and then upstream, what's <coughs> happening on, on the high school level? Why are students not going into why why are so few students going into into humanities disciplines? So we uh, so there's been a lot of research again about why why students what why students aren't doing it because of you know they want to go into more lucrative fields. Um, what's happening after you know colleges? Why students want you know more money after college? But very little has been done about on the secondary school level, right? So what can secondary schools like high schools and middle schools do to sort of stem the tide of the humanities crisis, right? If fewer students are going are going into the humanities, right, then way then 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 there really really will be no reason why uh, why schools support humanities departments. Um, I'll just give you an example. At YU, there are 20 philosophy majors across YU and Stern. Right, that's 10 on each campus. Uh, right, there are eight, I think 80, 80 English majors on both campuses. That has fallen in decline very precipitously. And, and and you know the departments, the departments are huge. We have a huge English department. English is the, the largest department, and really very few students. So, um, so so th those are really the, the, the questions that I'm looking at, um, and looking at how high schools played in the picture of the humanities crisis in general. Thank you very much. And you are, uh, first of all, two comments. One, this is sort of tied up with some of the things you are in the future. We are going into Teach for America, yeah. so next year you will be involved in high sure. school education probably. Mm -hmm. And you are still, it's not defined yet who your mentor will be. There are right. conversations, but yeah. they are still going on. <coughs> Exactly. Okay, so this is one of the cases in which the project is going ahead of the mentor. It's an exception, but it's right. one of the options that we right. have in the uh, in the humanities sometimes. Right, and part of it is also that's what I'm spending next semester doing because I'm not taking any other courses uh -huh. besides for two requirements. Yeah. Several students, by the way, are in that situation. Next semester, they are almost done with their courses, or so are taking one course, and they will be working full-time on, on their thesis. In the natural sciences, there are several in that situation. Uh, who wants to go next? Ili? Ili? Here. So you want it? Oh, you have the... Perfect. So I'll move away from you. Hi, uh, my name is Ali. Um, I'm, my thesis, or the, at least the working title, is Obesity, a Multidisciplinary Public Health Analysis of Potential Approaches and Bioethical Considerations. Um, so it's, it's sort of the intersection between bioethics and biomedicine um, as it relates to obesity with some other fields such as psychology, economics, sociology sort of thrown in to give a more multifaceted approach. My advisors are Dr. Popvin, who's the head of, uh, who's a, one of the biology faculty and who heads the uh, public health minor, the new public health minor, um, and Dr. Appel, who's a visiting professor, um, who's a prolific bioethicist um, and uh, um, has a strong pub, uh, background in public health and medicine. Um, there you go. Okay, so first, what is obesity? So I'll, I'll start with just sort of a straightforward, simple um, definition. Um, the way physicians, in, in, at least in the U.S., uh, define obesity is they use a formula called BMI, or body mass index, uh, weight in kilograms over height in meters squared, um, and... For someone who is 5'9", here's a chart basically of the rough um, sort of definitions of where um, someone would be underweight, normal weight, o overweight, and obese. And obesity is defined as a BMI of 30 or higher. Um, 
which for someone who's 5'9", or a male actually, who's 5'9", would be 203 pounds or more. Um, so this, this sort of rough, simple definition that you know, someone can calculate on the back of an envelope um, has its uses in its simplicity, but at the same time um, has weaknesses in that um, someone who, that it doesn't in any way reflect what, what the person's health, actual state of health is. Someone could be um, an athlete and be very muscular and short, but still be considered overweight, even though they're you know, at the peak of their health. Um, and that the sort of weakness in the definition of obesity in itself is something I'm going to explore, and how it relates to how ob what in interventions can be used or should be used um, bioethically for obesity. Um, so why why is why does obesity matter? Why do we care that there are people who are obese? Um, so obesity is overtaking smoking as the leading cause of prevent preventable death in the U.S. Um, obesity significantly increases the risks of coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, cancers, hypertension, dyslipidemia, stroke, liver and gallbladder disease, sleep apnea and respiratory problems, osteoarthritis, and gynecological problems. Um, so obesity is something that relates to a whole series of medical issues and concerns, um, and therefore, um, and is something that is the cause of, or, or can be the cause of sort of life um, choices rather than something like, let's say, Alzheimer's, which there is no, at least at the, in the moment, there is no behavior that can be changed or modified potentially to prevent Alzheimer's. Um, there might be, you know, some risk factors that are identified, but uh, essentially obesity stems from caloric intake minus um, caloric usage um, minus sort of um, entropic losses, um, sort of to bring in a little bit of physics. Um, I know this is the humanities, but, uh, but um, nonetheless, um, at least in, in the way that uh, physicians look at obesity, they see it as, as, a, as a, pr pr uh, a source of preventable death, something that, in theory, physicians can intervene and, and um, somehow change or, or uh, um, decrease the, the numbers of deaths from resulting, stemming from obesity. The reality is obviously a lot more complicated. Obesity is, is not at all a simple disease, um, and um, <coughs> if it is in fact a disease, and um, uh, the sort of status of uh, preventable is, is uh, somewhat ironic. So some obesity statistics. So currently in the U.S., 35.7% of U.S. adults are obese, and 69.2% are overweight or obese. Um, this this uh, graph over here um, shows how obesity, the rates of obesity, have changed over time, um, from 1960 to um, 2009, 2010. The rates of obesity have gone from about 10 percent to about 36, while the rates of people who are overweight have stayed stayed roughly constant. Um, and the as estimated annual co medical cost of obesity, and you know the the risk factors that the diseases that result from obesity, such as heart disease and so on and so forth, uh, you know, that I mentioned before, um, was about $147 billion. Um, and as we all know, um, sort of medical care costs are a, sort of a major source of concern uh, in the U.S., um, economically and so forth, so on. Uh, the Affordable Health Care Act tried to address that, in, at least in part. Um, but the, the cost of, of uh, obesity in the U.S., it's just, just in the U.S. is, is just massive. So is obesity actually a disease? Um, so in, in just now, just recently, the AMA, the American Medical Association, declared in, in 2013 that obesity is in fact a disease. For a long time, sort of, it was looked at as a, maybe it's a risk factor for actual diseases, um, maybe it's a symptom. Um, so why, why does it really matter? Is it just semantic? Um, why do we care whether or not it's defined as a disease? And on some level it is semantics, but at the same time, when, when um, obesity is defined as a disease, it is therefore addressed by healthcare professionals, by public health professionals in itself, not as a symptom of something else or as a risk factor of another disease um, or of a disease, but something that should be addressed in itself um, for individuals and society as a whole. Um, so some of the questions that I, at the moment, you know, I'm not going to try to answer or really even know the answer necessarily, but... Um, are biomedical interventions for obesity 
effective? Are, are gastric surgeries effective and uh, pharmaceutical interventions effective? Do, do physicians expect that the efficacy of such um, interventions, sort of addressing it as a medical disease, are they, are they going to increase in efficacy? Could, 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 could such, uh, such interventions just be the end-all, be-all sort of answer to obesity as a public health concern? Um, or how do they compare to non-biomedical interventions? Um, you know, s for instance, uh, social sort of schemes such as advertising. Just try to wrap it up. I will, certainly. Um, and, um, and also how it relates to um, the sort of e ethics of obesity intervention. There may be, there are interventions that could potentially be effective for obesity, but should, should, should they be used? And which ones are ethical to be used? For instance, um, I'm going to explore the question of hard versus soft paternalism. I won't go into full detail, but basically preventing people from being able to do certain actions versus sort of encouraging them through, you know, taxation or uh, where they still have a choice, but it's, it's just discouraged versus autonomy. Should, should, should uh, the government or physicians be telling people what to do? Is this a lifestyle choice that people should, you know, not be, in, that not be impinged upon? Um, and also societal good, you know, Healthcare costs and the taxpayer is, you know, is paying for healthcare interventions versus individual autonomy. Um, people should have potentially have the right to, you know, choose whether, what, how they live. Um, and is also is health a subjective or objective value? Can we say that it's objectively good to be healthy, or is it perhaps the choice of the person? Can we impinge on the person's autonomy by saying that health is an objective value? So these are sort of, you know, just a brief overview of some of the ethical and biomedical uh, concerns that I'm going to be exploring in my thesis. Okay. Who wants to go next? Next, you want to eat some more pizza? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Charles? <coughs> and then, then you are the last two. Great. Okay. okay. My name is Kaski Kopel. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, in my fourth year, so they call me a super senior. And I figure that a lot of you who came to hear these first lectures probably came because of a certain curiosity about what the, uh, what, the the what a thesis in the humanities is, looks like, and, and what it does to the student who decides to undertake one. So I'm just going to focus on that, and I'll, and I'll be brief about it. Because for me, undertaking the topic, which I'll describe to you in a moment, was a matter of, of identity. Because when I, when I think about uh, my, per my identity and values, one of the elements that plays a role in that, among many, is being American. Sort of defines my my surroundings, the, the cultural milieu I grew up in. And I think that there's a certain fundamental awkwardness that lies just underneath the surface of many people's proud American identity, and that is awareness of Native American heritage and identity. Um, it's something we have to grapple with, the realization that the nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal actually only happened, was only made possible as a result of a colonial project which effectively vanquished an entire world of hundreds of civilizations by destroying their social structures, destroying their governments, taking away their lands, and in many cases even ending entire uh, communities' way of life. Um, that's an awkwardness that I think actually helps answer some questions about, about the appearance of Native American heritage in expressions of American identity. Um, my thesis addresses the topic of the extinction thesis, which is a, which was a, uh, a belief that was prevalent in many different periods in American history, more so talking about the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. Uh, once we get to the mid to late 20th century, things start to change, and it was a belief that the Native American race is on the verge of extinction. It's a belief that guided the formation of many policies, going back to let's say uh, the wars fought against tribes in the early <coughs> days of the nation the policies of uh, attempted forced assimilation of, of Indian peoples, um, President, President Jackson's Trail of Tears policy, removing the southeastern tribes to Indian territory in Oklahoma. Um, and this belief, I'm gonna, what actually I'm going to focus on is, in particular, the time period around the turn of the 20th century, this belief manifested itself very <coughs> strongly, um, influenced by the rise in racial formalist theory that saw uh, different races as having different set formal characteristics, some of which are superior to others. And so in a confrontation between the white people and the red people, the white people had to win, according to the prevalent American belief. It's manifested itself in culture, um, in, in all sorts of, of fiction books that came out at the time, 
in a, a book, a, a famous novel, um, The Last of the Mohicans, which was actually written in 1827, was adapted to film six times around uh, between the years 1880 and 1905, I believe. And so clearly there was this, there was this uh, real, uh, there, there was a certain awareness and, and maybe even a wishful thinking, the racist kind of wishful thinking on the part of many white Americans that the Indians are about to be gone. And therefore, many believed it was the responsibility of white America to memorialize them. Um, I think in this room, some of us might be familiar with that concept from uh, the, an aborted project on the part of, of the Nazi regime to make a museum for the Jews. Um, so there was something similar that went on here. There were, there were monuments that went up prematurely across the continental United States memorializing the tribes before they were gone because of the belief that they would be gone. Um, in my particular research, I'm going to talk about the topic in general and I'm going to address lots of facets of the topic, but I'm going to use two particular instances of public memorialization as, as focal points. Um, I won't go into detail now, I'm really going to try and keep it brief, but there are two different statues that went up around this time. One of them, one, sorry, one of them was a project to, to, a, to erect a memorial to the race on Staten Island in a place called Fort Wadsworth. It was voted in by Congress in uh, 1913. President Taft attended the groundbreaking ceremony and gave, uh, gave the dedication speech. The project, never, the project was never completed because of costs, the difficulty of, of, uh, of providing the cost for such a, for a huge copper statue, which was intended to be taller than the Statue of Liberty, the tallest, item, the tallest feature of New York Harbor because of World War I. They didn't have the money for the copper. And another, another instance, which I'm going to discuss, is a sculpture that was featured at the Panama Pacific Intercontinental Exposition in San Francisco, when it, at, also around the, time, around the turn of the 20th century, there was a trend of fairs, these big con world's fairs and conventions celebrating American ingenuity and progress. And in one of them, there was a statue called, there was a statue that was featured and, and cherished and talked about for years, um, called The End of the Trail, which featured a, a Native American warrior on his horse, galloping with his head down in shame, slowly toward the west. And the image was clear, was unmistakable, an image of pushing the peoples into the sea that we finally triumphed. Look, we're in San Francisco, and here they're, they're facing the sea. They're almost gone. And there's a, there's a sense of sympathy there, but there's also a sense of triumph. And the reason this is significant for American identity is because there are glimpses of uh, appropriation of Indian identity and American identity throughout history that sometimes we may overlook. For instance, the, the Civil War general, William Tecumseh Sherman, of course had his middle name Tecumseh, like the great Shawnee warrior who led the fight against the United States in the early 19th century and, and the War of 1812. There was also a USS Tecumseh, which also participated on the Union side of the Civil War. Um, there are, I mean, just to keep on this Tecumseh theme, because he was, he was probably the, the best known, greatest uh, heroic figure in, in a collective Native American history. There are hundreds of, of towns and townships across the nation and public schools named after Tecumseh. So why is this? Is it that we feel pride for that he, Tecumseh was some kind of American? That he, he represents American her heroism or strength or, or values? In a certain sense, it may stem from the same desire to memorialize. Desire to memorialize the tribes, because memorializing the tribes um, helps us as a nation convince ourselves that the tribes are in fact almost gone, or even gone. Having that belief allows us to think about the crimes that Americans and Anglo-Americans, it's like going back to European, colo European colonial projects committed upon Native American peoples, allows us to think about them in terms of past tense rather than the present tense. And thinking about this in terms of the past tense rather than the present tense allows us to sort of assuage our guilt and, and um, it comes full circle, right? Taking ownership of Native American identity helps serve the purpose of erasing the Native American present. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be addressing that in terms of its manifestation to the turn of the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you. Just you mention your advisor. Oh, sorry. My advisor is actually somebody from outside of the institution, Dr. Christopher Pexa, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University um, and a, a scholar himself in Native American studies. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Okay. They'll be getting the, the best at the end. Um, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, when Dr. Kolich asked me to speak, I was a little bit, I guess, Surprised, um, I, I don't consider what I'm doing in the field of humanities, but I guess it's somewhat related. Yeah. Um, so the question I said I'm humanities and <coughs> social science. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you exactly. fall okay, within I'll, the I'll, social yes. science. Um, scientific, <laughs> the right side of my brain is being a little insulted right now, but okay. Um, 
Have you ever like been driving home from work or school and think about when I get home I need to take allergy medicine? Or and then you get home and you go to your room and you wonder, did I take the allergy medicine? I know I thought about it, I know I planned on it, but did I take it? I have these images in my head of taking the allergy medicine. But were these images I created when I was driving? Were these images I created when I walked in my house? Or is this an image of an actual memory? Is this type of mistake, namely namely confusing an intention for action performance with actual action performance that I want to st I'm studying and hopefully going to replicate in the laboratory. Before we go on, I want to take a uh, step back. For about 40 years, researchers have studied what causes people to, to experience what we call false memories. Um, a, a famous woman named Elizabeth Lof Loftus, you may have heard of her, she f she's basically defined the field of false memory. She's shown that if you have leading questions about a car color, the car, you saw a video of a car that was red, and you were asked what color was the blue car. In certain situations, about a third of people will believe the car was actually a different color than it was. Um, others, other researchers have shown a doctored photo, a false narrative. All these different tools can make people think that they did something or can experience that never actually occurred. That's the field of false memory. Then last year, and I guess kind of this will kind of, um, I guess, gauge what, how I discovered my thesis topic, I was in class with Dr. Annalisa Cohn, who doesn't, doesn't study false memory, but studies a new field of what they call perspective memory, or memory for future intent, or just intentions, intention for action performance. And when I was in her class, she was talking about what is, what is perspective memory? What is when we think about doing something in the future? And the current theory is that we create images of action performance. When I'm driving home from work, I think about taking the allergy medicine. I create this image in my head of taking the allergy medicine. False memory researchers say, when people, make, when people have memory mistakes, they misattribute thoughts that they have in their head as confirmation of actual, of actual action performance. So I wondered, great, shouldn't perspective memory, if I have these intention of action performance, if I have an intention for action performance, shouldn't I, in the right scenario, be able to make the mistake and think I actually did it? What's interesting is that no one's actually ever studied this. It makes perfect sense, and interestingly, in both the field of perspective memory and in the field of false memory, the researchers use similar language, but they never actually, no, no of these researchers have ever conversed. And last year, in an experimental psychology class, my partners and I created an experiment using taboo. For the sake of time, I'm not going to get into it, but we basically... Taboo is a charade, is like a verbal charade, like game. We have to get your partner to guess a word by describing it. And I gave, we gave people certain rules they had to perform, certain you know conditions they have to say certain things. And at the end, we told them that they, did, that they performed certain actions they never performed. And my study was significant. People, I when I gave people intentions to perform certain actions, but they never, never actually performed it because we controlled the experiment. They thought they did it, um, and kind of. The, my, my thesis this year is going to be twofold. First of all, is examining the literature out there. <coughs> As said before, no one's ever studied this question. So I'm collaborating with Dr. Annalisa Cohn, a professor at YU, who studies future intentions, and two researchers in Canada who study false memory, and kind of working with them to kind of create a conversation of two different fields and merge the two. Um, I'm going to be researching the, um, similar brain activation regions that I recently discovered last week. There's a lot of, the two, the two fields out there have a lot of overlap, and no one's ever conversed, and I hope to kind of do that, make the conversation one conversation, while at the same time expand my experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. You are the sort of, the only, we have people who do thesis with external mentors and internal mentors, and you are in the middle. You are have internal and external, that's public. Okay, and Dove Honig, Eat Honig, how, how do you go? Dove. Dove these days, good. Dove at last, and as I told Professor Senghaus, with his mentor, happens to be traveling to here from teaching as we speak. But tell us about your project. So I haven't given my project an official name, but if I were to sum it up in a few words, it would basically be the absorption of Hellenism into a Latin culture through Cicero, or through Cicero's influence. And essentially what I want to study is how Cicero... I guess influence, as the title suggests, how we influence Romans to accept Hellenistic culture or elements of it. Really, the truth is that I've got a lot of open-ended questions, such as, did he really do that? And if so, to what extent? Uh, can we quantify how much influence he had? Uh, the, the background for my question is I spent a semester with Louis Feldman studying two speeches of Cicero. Uh, we did uh, one speech called the Proarchia Poeta, which is uh, 
a case of court case where he was advocating for citizenship for his mentor, who was a Greek poet named Archias. Another speech was called In Catalinum, which was a prosecu uh, prosecution against Catiline, an uh, enemy of the state. And what I found when, when going over these with Dr. Feldman is that a lot of the arguments Cicero makes really center around what it means to be Roman or what it means to be Greek. And in certain cases, when you read both speeches together, he contradicts himself quite a bit. And you find that his, uh, his arguments were really created to suit purposes. And, you know, obviously he was a lawyer and these are public speeches. So the goal of my project is to do close readings and sort of analyze the rhetorical tools he uses. Uh, he has something that he sort of not, didn't quite invent, but uses quite closely called the tricolon, which is, you know, sets of threes, three verbs together to prove a point. Uh, so I want to look at the speeches and the rhetorical tools he uses, since those are purely rhetorical, and then also look at his letters, his personal letters, things like uh, to his friend Ar uh, to his friend Atticus, who was a famous writer who lived for part of his life in Greece. So I want to analyze his personal correspondence as well as his public speeches and see if they agree with each other, if they don't, where so. I also want to look at a number of sort of background questions that are important for this, such as what Latin literature existed before Cicero, what existed after, and sort of see the de trace the development. Um, part of this stems from a historiographical problem, which is that many historians sort of seem to take Cicero at face value and assume that because he, they just listen to his argument and assume that he was basically the first great Latin author who committed things to paper, and before him there was very little written Latin. So Cicero's own assertions have sort of been taken and influenced historians up until recently. So I don't necessarily want to, or have the ability to challenge that, and my goal is not to challenge it, to explore and see exactly, you know, if Cicero's telling a, a, a literal truth, if there was nothing before him, or if there, and if there was before him, what was his motivation sort of for very strongly bringing in Hellenism into his, his public uh, speeches and sort of analyze I guess the purpose of his rhetorical tools and see if if we can, ultimately I would like to know if we can quantify how much influence he had on written Latin, on writing, which was predominantly a Greek value before before him. Generally Latin was oral, not written, so I want to see if we can trace the influence that he had on the transition <coughs> to a more written culture. Um, I'm going to be working with Dr. Stenhouse on this. Uh, he trained as a classicist and now does the Renaissance, but I think he's a uh, who I'm going to be working with. I'm going to hopefully have Dr. Feldman as a reader, even though I don't think he, he doesn't really have the time or energy to dedicate to being a full-time advisor. So hopefully I'll have him as a reader. And in a nutshell, that is my project. So just to wrap it up, I wanted, first of all, to thank all the presenters and because they did a very good job, but also because we saw the richness and what interesting and fabulous subjects are there. I wanted to point to your attention, explicitly I didn't ask them or announce what are the majors of these students, but I want you to reflect on the fact that many of them, I mean, there are cases like Michael that is, a, is doing a project which is square in the middle of psychology or in the field of cognitive psychology, but there are many of you who are stretching out. I mean, you are taking a project that goes from literature in some sense to history and you are mainly well you are also a history major but you're mainly an English major or you would define yourself correct That's I mean. say just to okay <laughs> uh, Michael Schulman is a mathematics major uh, Ellie is a biology major that is stretching into the social dimension of things in public health so I want you to think uh, Hesky is even doing a bigger stretch and thinking really wide. So I want you to, to keep that in mind, that the thesis is an opportunity to broaden your horizons, to go out there. I am glad that students from the natural sciences are presenting today, as I always tell me when they ask me why do I have an interest in the humanities, they say that the humanities are too precious to me to leave them just in the hand of the humanists. So, <laughs> so I am very glad that some of the students in the, in the natural sciences are also part of this conversation and are seeing the value of the humanities, so I want to end up in a more positive note than yours that was. And I understand I, I share your concerns, but you know, at least here there are still alive and kicking. So 
thank you all for coming and well this project will go on and we'll hear from them you know by the end of this year and Liesl is taking over a little bit of this work you know all Liesl Schwab who will be replacing Professor Steinberg who will be on sabbatical next semester and she will kick you into shape in this project. That's right. So I'll be in touch um, you right. know, early January with the dates. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, we're going to just keep the Thank you, everybody, guys, and thank you for a wonderful you, semester. Come tonight if you can. You will enjoy it. Have some food. No, I think it's funny.